talk. Um, that, that, that's my nice shiny sort of professional for the website bio. Uh, I sort of racking my brain about how I frame uh, this talk because uh, it's something that's uh, I'm super passionate about, something that uh, is very important. Uh, my actual bio is that I am a, uh, one of the few, probably the only de developer in the industry from the uh, from the Vivian Lee Trailer Park in the rural Summerside, Prince Edward Island, Canada. Uh, I grew up playing games there. There's lots of people who did play games there, but I'm the only one. Um, I, I consider myself incredibly, incredibly lucky, uh, but I grew up with a very, very clean, keen understanding and demonstration of class dynamics. Uh, that sort of factored the way I framed uh, everything that, uh, that, that I've encountered since I've been lucky enough to be working in the game industry, particularly in social games. Um, so I just want to talk about some of the, sort of the research and things uh, that I've uh, come across. Now I will say I am not an economist. think I am wrong, tell me. I want to know. I want to get better at knowing this. I want to get better at being, being somebody who gets these sorts of uh, problems and, and uh, solutions addressed. So by all means, I, once again, this is a t context of discussion. Um, so let's start. Uh, 
Um, and now, since we've got the industry booming again, we see the Xbox 360 and the PS3 uh, sort of racking their way back up again, and there seems to be this chomping at the bit to maybe try that Neo Geo 3D model again and see if we can maybe make that luxury system. Maybe we can finally make that game system just for the rich people. Um, <laughs> and, and it's just sort of inkling towards that. Um, and the thing is, there's never been a time period where there has not been really a high-end gaming option. But often, if you, you know, if you couldn't afford you know, the average system, there wasn't much for you. Like, the, it's, it's sometimes going to inspire as part as, you know, the, when the Neo Geo was out, if you couldn't afford a Nintendo, your options was pretty much this. Um, and yes, I did pick the worst possible game you picked. That's uh, what Tiger Electronics. Uh, um, Go oh, the Castlevania 2 one was awesome. I played the shit out of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now you're seeing the thing about this is we should, we, we, the other factor, and I think we go back quickly. And if we just look at the average annual wages, you know, that, that's another factor in here. In that, that is also a problem. In that, in only two of the thirty years consoles have been around, has the lowest fifth. 20%, the lowest fifth quintile, had greater gains than the median, or even equal gains than the median. The difference has been averaging about $987. I mean, that's how, that's how much in the hole the bottom of the economic strata is sort of staying at um, in, terms, uh, in terms of uh, earning power. Uh, and buying power has not got much better for them. Uh, wage increases for the bottom 20% have only matched inflation four out of those 30 years. Uh, the difference averaging to be about 2.6% less. So what this means, means that consoles are getting further and further and further and further away from being accessible to that lower 20%. Though they have been, and some of our most greatest times of prosperity as an industry have been when they actually have been accessible, but they're still getting further and further away. So consoles are not just for the rich yet, but they're certainly not for the poor, and that situation is getting worse. But wait, what about mobile? Everybody's got mobile. Everybody in the trailer park's got a phone, even. And that's the thing. And that's a big new industry, and there's so much investment, and mobile is going to be the thing that saves us, right? Well, we got to follow the line. Because when you're talking about mobile for lower class, you are talking about Android. We have to be perfectly honest about that. It's the fastest growing market for phones. It's the fastest growing internationally, but it is the fastest growing specifically because of gains in that, that particular economic strata. And Android developers are seven percent of what iPhone devs do. So if you want to make games specifically and say, hey, I'm going to make games for you know for, for this economic strata then uh, you've got a really risky decision that, you, uh, that, that, that you've got to make as a developer uh, to, uh, to you know, specifically put it on Android uh, as opposed to the iPhone or even tailoring an Android game differently. Um, and because it's a huge, huge deal, the iPhone as business is nearly twice the size of Google's entire operation. We like to think of Google as a gigantic monolith that brings in a lot of money. But compared to the iPhone, they are really just a drop in the bucket when you're talking Android versus iPhone specifically. The iPhone being a luxury device. Now, I have one, don't get me wrong. Like, I, you know, I, I, picked, I picked one up specifically because I needed one in the industry when I got in. It was just an absolute fact. But when I go back home to PEI, none of my friends have any. So I can't make games for them if I'm in one iPhone. Business is indicating. The cheaper phones are second class citizens. It is a secondary market, despite the fact that it is growing right now, uh, especially growing internationally, and that people will actually, especially in free to play models, actually pay on the Android. You, if you, the money that comes from Android generally comes from free to play models, and they actually tend to, free to play games tend to do better on the Android than they do on the iPhone. So the question is, okay, cool. Is that really, does that answer all the questions? What do we do? I mean, what do we do? But we have to figure out who we are and, and who we've been in order to be, before we can really address that. So the developer, let's talk about us. So I want to talk about price points for entry. And I want to include it in that, is price points for the education. 
that, it that it's traditionally taken to be a developer uh, in this industry. So, um, did everybody, uh, how many people heard about the OUYA? The going up? Yeah, that, and I got, saw that and I was like, wow, $99 console, open source, super excited, super excited that this is going. I was like, okay, this is going to be a great thing. And then I watched the video. And I watched the video of that, of that nice, super professional lady uh, talking about it. And she was all like, I remember the days when you only had to have one computer to be a developer. I remember the days back when all you needed was just one guy and an Apple II. <coughs> an Apple fucking II. <laughs> <laughs> Adjusted for inflation, that's 211 hours the average person would have to do now to just be that guy working in the basement with just Apple II. Um, so, okay, that was the 80s, I get it, you know, being an engineer was a rarer thing, it was much harder, and, you know, prices for manufacturing were super high, we had to master it, you know, it was expensive getting in at the time, okay, I get it, early 80s. So let's go to the 90s, average 1992 PC with a graphics card of 3865 dollars So, uh, it's 141 hours. And you'll say, okay, cool, we're living in the age of netbooks now. Everybody can go and build those things right now. And are we encouraging people to do that? Well, I've talked to lots of students at uh, all the various super progressive game design colleges uh, that are supposed to be solving this problem. And the recommended system for new game students is over $4,000. So, even the most, uh, even the most generous is 141 hours is uh, around five to seven times more expensive than the actual system that people play. That's a multiplier, five times. So generally that means you would have had to have five, you or your family would have to have five times disposable income to be a developer than you do have to do to be 